Hello, it's Reija and today I'm going to be talking about translations. This video is going to cover a few things. First I'm going to be talking about intertextuality, then I'm going to be covering domestication versus foreignization, and then go over what we should take into consideration when critiquing and talking about translations. And finally I'm going to talk about why we should support translated works in the first place. Now recently I watched this video by Professor Matthew Reynolds, which I will link down in the description. And in that video he described that he described the use of language in a way that we as people use translation processes even when we are talking to other people in our native language. And this uh, happens because various people from various different fields might have specific terminology uh, from that field, for example, computer science or fashion industry, that is not readily accessible to the layperson. So that means that when we are having uh, conversations about pro our professional fields with people who are not in those fields themselves, they are using translation processes to decipher what is being said to them. And I thought that that was really interesting um, because it um, implies that translation and translative processes are present in our lives all the time. And this leads me to the two things that I actually want to cover, which are intertextuality and domestication versus foreignization. Intertextuality is the theory that all texts are linked to other texts that perceive them. For example, an author uh, who is writing a novel draws from texts that they have read themselves. And when a translator comes in to translate that work, they are then drawing from all the texts that they have read. And when the text finally reaches the reader, the reader is drawing from the texts they have read and drawing their own conclusions and own interpretations of the text based on that. And intertextuality, in my opinion, is very interesting because that means that the author is subconsciously drawing from texts um, that they have that they have knowledge of. And that means that they might write in allusions, which in turn um, may become a problem for the translator, because the translator needs to make sure that the reader in the target audience, in the target language, understands what is being referenced, what is being alluded to. And a translator can work around this in many ways they can try to preserve the text and translate the allusion word for word, or they can modify the text uh, and domesticate the phrase um, in a way that is easily accessible to the target audience because uh, the meaning has been translated in a way that is accessible to them because uh, it is uh, familiar. That brings me to domestication versus foreignization, or as I'd like to call it, Vagins versus Reppuli. A translator can use domestication and foreignization as a set of tools. For example, in a historical fiction novel like The Color Purple by Alice Walker, a translator might leave all the names, all the place names untranslated and therefore keep, um, keep the text foreignized and not uh, domesticated because it takes place in the real world and the reader will have access to the knowledge uh, about where those places are and and the fact that the story takes place in the United States. So there is a certain familiarity in leaving the names and place names untranslated. Whereas a story like The Lord of the Rings or um, a Song of Ice and Fire, which doesn't take place in the real world. It is plausible then to translate some of the place names and translate some of the um, surnames and names of the people uh, because it takes place in a fantasy 
land. So that means that the reader is more ready to accept changes and translations. For example, in Lord of the Rings, the name Baggins is translated into Reppuli. Bag End becomes Repumpa, uh, Middle Earth becomes Keskima. All these names that have um, direct um, meaning that is readily accessible to the reader in the first place in the source language itself become more acceptable to translate. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it feels out of place because those names have meaning in the first place. One good uh, example about domestication is, in my opinion, the Phoenix Wright series. The original series takes place in Japan and all the characters have names that are, in fact, puns in the Japanese language. And the way the translators approached this uh, was to make the game be set in Los Angeles in the translated versions uh, and have the names be translated um, so that they are puns in the English language as well. And this, uh, while being a very ingenious way to uh, translate the game, has led to some very interesting things. For example, there are now samurai and psychics in Los Angeles, which might feel out of place, but you forgive that because the game is so out there in the first place that this doesn't feel like a big thing. And now let's talk a little bit about foreignizing. Foreignizing is the opposite of domesticating, where, uh, where in domesticated text um, the author is trying to make it accessible to the target language by uh, accommodating uh, phrases and uh, language that are present in the target language. In foreignizing, the translator is trying to preserve the text and may actually uh, decide to leave some of the sentence structure present in the source language to have a kind of foreign flavor. For example, I was reading uh, The Hard Boiled Wonderland by Haruki Murakami and I noticed, uh, having studied Japanese, that the sentence structure in that translation was very similar um, to the Japanese sentence structure. There was a lot of uh, layering and kind of um, redundancy that wouldn't be present in, uh, in a very grammatically and semantically and pragmatically correct English. Uh, but it didn't feel out of place. Uh, but that's just something to take into consideration. Now that I've covered intertextuality and domestication versus foreignization, let's talk about some of the things that we need to take into consideration when we are talking about translations and critiquing translations. First of all, we need to take into consideration racial bias. What kind of language the translator is using? Are they translating their work in a way that adds in racially loaded phrases and racially loaded uh, terms? Is there cultural bias? Are they foreignizing the work in order to make it sound more exotic? This has been a case, for example, when people have been translating um, works written by Asian authors in the past. And also, what is the intent of the translation? Is it to make it more accessible to the target audience by way of, say, domestication? Or does the translator or publisher uh, want to preserve a kind of foreign feeling in order to make it seem more exotic? And then we need to also take into consideration logistical issues. For example, translators work under time constraints. They have deadlines that they need to meet. There's also uh, laws that are, need to be taken into consideration, as was the case uh, when V.E. Schwab had a thing with a Russian publisher who had decided to omit uh, all allusions to LGBTQ plus themes because of the Russian, L Russian propaganda laws regarding LGBTQ plus issues. And then there is also publisher meddling um, in terms of uh, wanting to add in 
more action, wanting to use certain language in order to promote the work, etc. And, and a good translator has to work in the confines of good translation practices and it is a kind of tightrope walking between having to having to work within good translation practices and having to work within logistical logistical uh, constraints and also working within the frame of their own biases so i'm going to read now an excerpt from the unknown soldier first and finish i have provided subtitles and then a translation from the 1970s that may be a bit unusual. <köhön> First in Finnish. Lepän oksat rätisivät hänen korvissaan, mutta hän nousi seisomaan ja huusi. Kolmonen kuuluu komentooni ja pysyy paikoillaan. Kuka kehtaa jättää asemansa tämän jälkeen? Joku kiväärimies lähistöllä kehtasi. Hän alkoi kontata poispäin, kun Kariluoto oli huudollaan saanut vihollisen kiihdyttämään tulensa ja suuntaamaan sen heitä kohti. Mihin te menette? Mies ei vastannut, välyili vain maahan ja Kariluodon korkeahenkinen mieliala oli tipotiessään. Hän alkoi ivata ja kirota miestä ja saikin tämän takaisin asemaan, mutta paha maku tapauksesta jäi hänen suuhunsa. And then the English translation, which was actually published in 1975. See if you can spot the difference. Bullets were flying about his head, but he rose and shouted, God damn you, I'll put a bullet through the first one of you who takes a step backward. An infantryman near him was, however, more frightened of the Russians than of the usually mild-mannered Kariluoto. Scuffling like a crab, he set off on all fours toward the rear. Halt, damn you, halt, Kariluoto was livid. The man kept going without even a backward glance. Once again, Kariluoto cursed and screamed at the man to come back. Then abruptly, he turned, snatched the rifle from the hands of the soldier next to him, aimed and fired. The bullet took the fugitive in the small of the back. He screamed, pitched forward, tried to rise once and then slumped to the ground dead. Without another glance, Kariluoto handed the rifle back to its owner and turned his attention again to the front. Now, as I was telling you just now about good translation practices and what kind of things a translator needs to take into account when translating a work and what we as readers need to take into account uh, when we are reading translated works. Um, this example is not in accordance with good translation practices. Um, it doesn't give a favorable picture of what the translator thinks about the source work uh, because they have um, decided to add in more action and it also implies uh, a not very favorable picture of the source culture. So now that we have covered those topics, why should we support translated works in the first place? Now, first of all, I would like to mention that coming from a nation that has approximately rough estimate 6 million speakers worldwide, um, including expats. That's like a fraction of the populace of the whole world. Which means that as a niche um, language, we have relied a lot on translated uh, works over here. For example, we import a lot of uh, media, a lot of movies, a lot of TV, and they are subtitled. So we rely on good translations a lot in this country. And that's why translated works are very important to me personally. Now, why you should support la translated works is also to support global authors. For example, someone in South Korea, in Japan, in Pakistan, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in, um, in Egypt writing in their native language. When they get their work published in other languages, that means that their work gains an accessibility and reach that they didn't have before. 
And also, it is not possible for one person to learn all the languages in the world, even though it's a commendable effort and I like learning languages myself. And I've had to learn languages in order to access uh, some of the media that I want to consume. Um, it, it's just not plausible for one person to learn all the languages, which then means that we have to consume translated works. It's just not possible to avoid it. And therefore we should support good translators. And then comes the reality that some people do not have the resources to learn languages. We are still living in an age where there is an illiteracy problem in some parts of the world where people um, can't read, let alone uh, be able to learn other languages and read in other languages. So therefore it is extremely crucial that they be provided with works in their own native language, be it um, published by their native authors or uh, foreign authors that get translated into that language. It is extremely crucial so that they can um, focus their resources into learning to read. So those are just a few examples on why we should support translated works. And let's also think about how reading translated works and comparing and contrasting them um, with the original work, with someone who has read the original text and knows the original text. It opens up lots of different interesting conversations. And also reading translated works means that you are broadening your horizons. You are making sure that you have as wide a range of fiction and non-fiction to choose from as possible. If you just read in the languages you know how to speak, um, you are narrowing your viewpoint. You are narrowing the media that you consume. And also we need to take into consideration that when a professional translator translates the work, they are translating it with a thorough knowledge of not only their own culture to which they are translating into, but of the source language and the source culture. And when you have learned another language, you personally may not have the same kind of professional knowledge of the culture, even if you know the language. So that kind of colors the way you understand the text. And that's pretty much all I wanted to say on this topic. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up. And this video has been first in a series of my Road to Translate-a-thon videos, which is a readathon that I'm going to be hosting in March, and I will be uploading the announcement video next week. So look forward to that, and I will see you in another video. Bye bye!